Hey you guys, time once again for Tomes of Terror, my book review show. Got kind of an interesting one today. This is a Japanese thriller, mystery, psychological horror type of book. And it is called Confessions by Kanai Minato. Hopefully I'm pronouncing that right, or at least in the ballpark. Um, if, if I didn't, I'm very sorry. So this is Miss Minato's first novel. Uh, apparently she used to work in the educational system. She was a teacher or something of that nature. And she was also a housewife. Evidently she wrote this book like in between chores, like on the weekends and in the evenings. This book, apparently it first came out in 2008 in Japan and it was a massive hit there. Um, so I guess that they, that the publisher was kind of like, well, it was such a big hit in Japan that they wanted to, so they did a bunch of translations and it henceforth became a very, very large, like international kind of book sensation. I had hadn't heard about it when it came out, but I heard about it probably six months ago or something like that. When I heard somebody on Goodreads or something like talking about it. Yeah, please correct me if I'm wrong, but I believe there was a short film. I don't think it was a feature length film, but I think there was a short film that was based on this novel, but I have not seen it. So I'm basically just going uh, by the book. Now I will say I'm not going to spoil anything directly, like any big plot twists or anything like that. But this is going to be kind of mildly spoilery because it's really, really hard to talk about without talking about some of the plot points and kind of conveying like how deeply twisted and messed up this fucking book is because it is. Now it's not gory or nothing like that. It's not gory at all. It's just very psychologically fucked up. Okay, so this, if you like that kind of thing, then you will probably really dig this. So the writing style of this is actually very direct, very straightforward. Just like the last book I talked about, which was The Nightmare Room by Chris Sorensen, I basically read almost this entire book like in one sitting. Um, I think what ended up happening with this one is that like I read the first section and kind of looked over at Tom and said, this book is fucked up, like already, like for, at the end of the first section. And then like the following evening, I was like, oh, I'm, you know, I'd really like to finish this book. And I think I pretty much like finished it other than the last cut, like couple of pages. And um, so it's a, so it's a really quick read. It's not like, you know, it's not real dense literary fiction or anything like that. It's very, very easy to read. It's also in kind of an epistolary style. Um, if you don't know what that is, it's you, people that are like, you know, it's told through letters, you know, journal entries, blog entries, you know, pe people talking. So it's set up in six chapters, but they're really long chapters. Um, so they're more, it's more like sections. So it's like six sections. And each section is from a different character's point of view, either something they're saying, like a lecture they're giving or something that they wrote to somebody, like a letter that they wrote to somebody. And it's interesting because it almost, you almost get this kind of thing where it's kind of the same situation that they're talking about, but you're seeing other people's perspective on it. And so as the book goes on and each character gives their version of the story or, you know, their part that they played in the story that you didn't like know about, it kind of, you know, opens up like new, like peeling off layers of an onion, you know what I mean? So it's not, it's not just a kind of case where six people are like talking about the exact same thing. It's like, they're talking about the same aspects, you know, of this big overarching kind of plot. Now the plot for this, it's basically a revenge story. The first section of the book is told from the point of view of a middle school teacher and her name is Yuko Moraguchi. Now it's interesting because she's addressing uh, members of her class. And at first you're not really sure what her lecture is getting at. Like she kind of has them stay after school because there's something important that she wants to tell them. So at first she's kind of going all over the map. She's talking about uh, this program that the school had started that was trying to get like all the Japanese school children like to drink milk because it was good for them. And so they came in with like free milk every day and everybody drank it and had their own little, you know, carton with their name on it and the little cubby and everything. So she's talking about that. Then she's talking about another teacher who was a mentor of hers. And so she's talking about a couple of things that seem like they're unrelated. And then as she, as her talk goes on, she gets to kind of the meat of the issue. The meat of the issue is that her little girl, Minami, who was four years old, 
Um, she would bring her to the school sometimes, like if she had to work late because she was a single mother and she didn't have anybody to watch her. So the little girl would come to the school and like sometimes the other girls would play with her or she would like put her in the office and people would watch her and things like that. But it came to pass that one day, uh, Manami had wandered off to feed a neighbor's dog and ended up but what appeared to be falling into the pool and drowning at the school. Now, at first you're thinking, cause she's telling the students that she's retiring. So everybody thinks, oh, well, because of the tragedy, because you know, obviously her four year old daughter died and it was very terrible and it was an accident. But then as she goes on, she basically says like drops the bombshell that no, actually Manami was not, it wasn't an accident. She was murdered by two of you and I know who it is. With that kind of revelation, she kind of goes on and on about, she's like, well, I found out who it was like a while and they confessed and all this other stuff. Cause she kind of goes on and on too about child killers and about how much leeway um, is given to children who kill. Um, so she's kind of talking about that and she's kind of talking about it like from a Japanese cultural standpoint, like it, it's becoming more common, like for, you know, really little kids to become murderers, uh, because they want attention or they want to get famous or something like that. So she goes a little bit into that as well. So she's basically saying, well, I don't really trust the justice system to deal with you children because these kids are like 13, 14 years old. Um, so I'm going to exact my own revenge on you while letting the police continue to think that Minami's death was accidental. So basically what she does, and like I said, mild spoilers, mild spoilers, because I didn't know this going in and like this was the thing, this was the revelation in the first section of the book that made me go, man, this shit's fucked up. So if you don't want to know, then turn it off now because it's going to get like kind of spoilery from here on out. So basically what she did, the reason she was bringing up all this stuff earlier about, uh, you know, the free milk program and all that other kind of stuff and this other teacher that was her mentor that she admired. The reason she was bringing that up is because one, the teacher she admired was also her fiance at some point, but they had decided not to get married. Uh, Manami was his daughter as well. They had decided not to get married because it turned out that he had AIDS and he was dying. And he didn't want to like burden her. So they kind of, they were still like friends and stuff, but they didn't really like, I guess he didn't want to burden her or whatever. That was kind of important to know. And she said that the revenge that she was taking on these two boys that murdered her daughter was that she had taken some of this dude's blood, like without his knowledge and had injected it into the milk cartons that were going to those two little boys, thereby she, I think that you don't really find out until later on that she was just like, well, I didn't really care one way or the other if you got AIDS or not. I just wanted you to worry about it so that, you know, you would know what it was like, like to know that your death was coming or something like that. So that was kind of her revenge. And this is, like I said, this is only the first section uh, of the book from her point of view. And then from there, like the second section um, is told from the point of view of another girl in the class um, and she is writing a letter back to uh, Yuka Moraguchi, like telling her what happened subsequently, like after she retired and they got a new teacher to come in. So she's kind of talking about another thing that uh, Moraguchi wanted to do was that she wanted it to get around that the two boys had AIDS. Like she wanted to tell everybody so that everybody would treat them like pariahs and would start bullying them. So that was like another uh, tendril of her revenge also. So this girl is kind of telling what happened. Now she ended up getting bullied too because it was kind of like this Lord of the Flies situation where everyone just kind of turned on it. And that if you if they perceived that you thought that you were sympathetic toward one of the child killers, then they would turn on you as well. And they, so all that fucked up shit happened. And then, you know, as it goes on, like more and more aspects of this revenge plot um, kind of come to the fore. Now there are actually two sections of the book um, are told from the point of view of the two boys. So you can get some insight into why they did what they did. And the one kid, the two kids' names were, were Shuya and Naoki. And one of them was kind of like the mastermind. It's, it was a weird kind of situation because one of them was a mastermind. He was like a genius. And he was one of those really like, uh, you know, and you have to think this kid's like only 13 or 14 years old. He's one of those like weirdly like Nietzschean kids where, 
he thinks because he's smarter than everyone else or he's better at school than everybody else, then he can just like do what he wants to. So he's basically, he had a mom who was an electrical engineer and she like taught him all of this stuff. So he knows how to like build all these things. You know, he really likes to invent stuff. And it turned out that one of the things he invented weirdly was like this change purse that would electrocute you if you touched it. At first it wouldn't electrocute you and like kill you because he wanted to take it to the science fair as like, oh, it's an anti-theft device. Like if somebody tries to steal it, steal it, they'll, you know, it'll electrocute them or shock them. But he had built like an amped up version and that was what he, he wanted to experiment on someone to see if it worked or not, see if it would kill a person. And so that's when they settled on Manami, you know, the little four-year-old girl that came around the school and everybody knew whose daughter that was and whatnot. But it turned out that the shock actually, they thought it killed her, but it didn't. And then, so what ended up happening was that the that guy left and then the other kid that was there saw that the girl, girl was still alive and thought, oh shit, we're gonna get in trouble and then threw her in the pool and drowned her. So they were both like kind of responsible for the murder, like, you know, in that way, you know, they each kind of tell their side of the story. And then, um, you know, one of the murderer's sisters and moms like has a say. And, uh, you know, so it's just like this really long, I mean, it's not long, but it's just like this really complicated revenge tale. And the end of it is great too, because I mean, as like all this shit unfolds about, you know, the AIDS and the bullying and what really happened, like why the kids did what they did, like what their motivations were and um, all this other stuff, it kind of comes to the fore that, um, and as I said, again, this is, I'm not saying exactly what happened, but it's like kind of mild spoilery. It kind of turns out that Yuka Moriguchi, the teacher from the beginning who did the AIDS milk and everything, she had like this big master plan, like even more than that. As the book goes on, there's like just more and more details being added to her like nefarious revenge. So it's really, this book, like I said, it is so, so twisted. Not in the sense of it being like gross or anything like that. It's just... The frightening thing about this book is that everybody in it, there's really not that many likable characters, but that's okay. That's not like a ding against it because the characters are fascinating, even though they're, most of them are really, really unlikable. Even the ones that are kind of unlikable and the shit that they do is like not forgivable, you can understand why they did it. That's what's so great about this book is that no matter how shitty, like the stuff that the people in this book do, you can un you can't condone it, but you understand how somebody might have come to that pass where they would actually do that kind of shit. So nothing seems crazy. Nothing seems like it. None of them seem um, psychotic or that they have anything wrong with them necessarily, like in a big splashy kind of way. All of them seem like real relatable people who are just put into these particular situations and acted accordingly. So you can kind of, so like I said, you're not condoning like what they do because everybody in this book is pretty shitty, even though some of their actions are understandable, but it's still like a really fascinating and really like dark look, you know, not just um, at kids that commit crimes, but lengths that people will go to to like get revenge if they think that the justice system isn't going to give them any satisfaction in that regard. So even though everyone's kind of a villain, everything is just completely, you know, the way it, the way it plays out is pretty believable, even though it is super, super messed up. And even though it's kind of super, it, it's kind of like a really grim look at human nature, I guess. But for all that, I found it weirdly entertaining, even though it's a really not fun exploration of like the psychology of not just terrible people, but people in general, like pushed into certain situations and how they might react in maybe a way that from the outside seems like really horrible. But it's just, it was just a fascinating, fascinating book. And like I said, the, some of the bombshells in this I think when I was reading this book, I actually like gasped out loud like a few times, like when I was reading it, which I which I don't usually do a lot, but it's like, you know, like at the end of the first section, at the end of, I think the second or third section or something like that, there was just like this sentence at the end and I was like, oh, what? You know what I mean? So it was just, it was just kind of doing that kind of shit. So 
as I said, I think this is probably because I don't read um, a lot of manga or anything like that. So I don't read a lot of Japanese fiction, but this had gotten so many good reviews. I had seen it, you know, on some other YouTube channels that I watched that have book reviews on them. I kept seeing this one coming up, like in the recommendations. And I was like, man, that sounds pretty good. It's like, maybe I should check that one out. So definitely, I think um, Kanai Minato has written uh, a couple other books since then, because like I said, this came out back in, in uh, 2008. So she's written a couple since, and I'll definitely be reading some more of her stuff because this book was phenomenal. I really, really enjoyed it. And it was like super messed up and twisted, which I love. Um, I will say that like, I, I love that on the cover of this, um, this other writer called it, if Albert Camus had written Heathers, which I guess... That's kind of it. And it has like, a, I guess it has a little bit asp of aspect to of a, like Battle Royale too, but not that, you know, not that epic or like violent or anything. This is more like an insidious, nasty, like psychological revenge horror. You know what I mean? And you will just be like horrified at like what the people in this fucking book do. But but not in a way that it's like, oh, that's not believable or anything. Like you can kind of see how, how they got from A to B. And I think that's what's really like disturbing about this book. Because I did find this book like actually really, really disturbing. So, you know, if all that gushing didn't clue you in, um, I would actually really recommend this book if you're into psychological horror, if you like Asian horror, if you like anything that's like a revenge type thriller, any Anything like that or kind of like a mystery um, I think you will really really dig this you know like I said it seems like it got like a big uh, it made a big splash when it came out like um, in translation like around the world in 2008 or 2009 whatever it was um, but somehow it slipped under my radar so I'm really glad I finally got around to reading it so as I said it's called Confessions by Kanai Minato uh, so definitely check it out and I will see you on the next one bye